I'm Dr. Robin Chuckan. Welcome to today's office hours on cognitive decline and the gut. And let me just remind you all, I know you know this, but this is for educational purposes. This is not actually medical advice. Okay, so let's get started. We have a lot to talk about today. Do you know that song? I won't sing it because I'm a terrible singer, but um, you know, the hip bone's connected to the thigh bone, the thigh bone's connected to the knee bone, the knee bone, it's all connected. I'm here to tell you it's all connected. And that really, when I talk about being an integrative gastroenterologist, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about being a functional medicine doctor. I'm not a functional medicine doctor. I'm a conventionally trained gastroenterologist, board certified, but I believe in the integration of these systems. In other words, what is going on in your gut is intimately connected to what is going on in your immune system. Of course, 70 to 80% of the immune system is physically in the gut. It is intimately connected to brain health and to neurological function and cognitive function. So we're going to start by talking about the <clears throat> enteric nervous system, the second brain in your gut. Just real quick, I'll, I'll give you the highlights for what we're gonna talk about today in the first 25 minutes, 30 minutes, and then I wanna make sure I get to all your questions. So we're gonna talk about the enteric nervous system, the second brain in the gut. We're going to talk about the gut-brain connection. Then we're gonna talk about how two things in particular antibiotics and ultra processed foods affect the gut. And then we're gonna put it all together with the fourth thing we're gonna talk about, which is how those two things, antibiotic use and ultra processed foods affect the brain via their effects on the gut, okay? So let's get started with the enteric nervous system. So you've all experienced butterflies in your stomach or you know feeling nauseated before you have to give a talk or that sort of sense of anxiety, fear, nervousness in your gut. Those are the neurons in your gut actually at work. So the enteric nervous system refers to the second brain. And it was um, Dr. Gershon, who was at Columbia when I was a medical student, who really sort of coined this term and wrote a book called The Second Brain a long time ago. And so this is a whole field of neurogastroenterology. And Dr. Emron Mayer out at UCLA is another very eminent neurogastroenterologist who wrote um, The Mind-Gut Connection, a book several years ago, great book. So we know that we have about seven times as many nerve cells in the gut as we have in the spinal cord, which is part of the peripheral nervous system. We don't have as many as we have in the central nervous system, of course, in our actual brain, but they're connected not just because there are nerve cells in the gut, but because of the production of many neurotransmitters. The one that people know about is serotonin, which we, we commonly refer to as the feel-good hormone. And we know that the majority of serotonin, depending on what study you read, it's 80%, 90%, 70%, the majority, is made in the gut. It's made by the microbiome. The microbiome are sort of co-synthesizers of serotonin, the same way they are co-synthesizers of vitamin K, a hormone that's essential for clotting. So if you are on a broad spectrum antibiotic for let's say more than you know a week, one of the things you will notice is that your blood will not clot as well. Now at home, you may not notice that, but if you were in the hospital, when the phlebotomist goes to draw your blood in the morning, they would typically um, tell the nurses or the doctors say, hey, this person needs some vitamin K. When I draw blood, they're continuing to bleed. So we know that the microbes, the gut bacteria, are co-synthesized with vitamin K. And the same way you cannot make vitamin K if you knock off a lot of your gut bacteria, the same thing with serotonin, which is why we see mood disorders, we see anxiety, we see dysthymia, we see anxiety, depression combinations in people with a lot of gut inflammation. Now, let's be clear, this is not the only cause of mood disorders, okay? There are other hormonal causes, there's genetic predisposition, there's environmental influence, etc. So I'm not suggesting that gut inflammation or gut dysbiosis, a disrupted microbiome, is the only cause of mood disorders, but it is an important contribution. And what I see in my world of autoimmune gastrointestinal diseases, can't even say it myself, um, diseases like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, is that when those diseases are very active, there often is an accompanying mood disorder. And we used to talk about it decades ago as the Crohn's personality. Now we know there's not a Crohn's personality, but when you have a very inflamed gut with a disrupted gut microbiome and dysbiosis, it affects production of these neurotransmitter hormones. And so it can cause mood disorders. And conversely, what I see in my Crohn's and ulcerative colitis patients 
is that as the inflammation heals and their gut gets back to normal, often their mood disorders improve dramatically too. So, and it's not just with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, two types of autoimmune disease that form inflammatory bowel disease, different from IBS. IBD, IBS, two distinct conditions. We also see this in something called post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome. So somebody who has an infectious episode, so it could be foodborne like Campylobacter, it could be parasitic, it could be a traveler's diarrhea, that they are often, you know, they have the acute illness and then their gut recovers, but it is never quite the same. And lo and behold, they're eventually diagnosed with post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome. Well, we see mood disorders accompanying that too. And there's a famous experiment that was done in mice where mice were inoculated with large amounts of uh, Campylobacter jejuni. Again, one of those bacterial illnesses that is commonly associated with foodborne illnesses. And they were able to induce anxiety in the mice by inoculating them with Campylobacter jejuni. Well, we see the same thing after many, not all, of these infectious episodes is that people say, not only is my gut not normal, but I don't feel normal. I'm more anxious, I'm moody, I'm sad, like something is off, okay? And so we know that that is a result of disruption of the microbiome by the infectious episode. Because remember, it's not just antibiotics and proton pump inhibitors and steroids that can affect your gut microbiome. An infectious episode can also, because proliferation of that pathogen, infectious organism, can crowd out a lot of the healthy microbes and disrupt the microbiome, okay? And in the case of something like SARS-CoV-2, we know that binding of the SARS-CoV-2 virus to the ACE2 receptors, which remember are way more plentiful in the gut, that binding can itself induce dysbiosis. And that's true for other viral illnesses too. So we know, you know, it's sort of this vicious cycle because we know that dysbiosis, a disrupted microbiome, is associated with worse outcomes from COVID and other viral illnesses, but we also know that COVID itself can induce dysbiosis. So um, again, you know, there are a lot of different mechanisms for how these things develop, not suggesting that the gut-brain interaction is the only one, but it's an important one to consider, particularly if you were dealing with an inflamed gut or dysbiotic gut that's new, and you were also dealing with a mood disorder that's relatively new or worsening of an existing mood disorder, okay? So how else do the gut and brain communicate? Well, they communicate via the 10th cranial nerve called the vagus nerve and that is bi-directional communication. So the gut is sending signals to the brain and also producing these neurotransmitter hormones that are giving signals to the brain. And these signals from the gut are influencing behavior, mood, cognition. And conversely, the gut is communicating with the brain. And what is, a, sorry, conversely, the brain is communicating with the gut. And what is a brain doing? The brain is influencing gut motility. So how you know rapidly or slowly the gut contracts, which is why some people, when they're very anxious or depressed, typically with depression, we see a slowdown of gut motility and people become constipated. With anxiety, we can see speeding up, increase in peristalsis. So the brain is also affecting the gut and determining, uh, well, not 100% determining, but influencing motility. What else does the brain influence? It influences secretion of digestive enzymes and it influences assimilation and absorption of nutrients. So that, you know, you can be eating the same diet and depending on your mental state, you could be absorbing more or less of those nutrients. You could be secreting more or less of these digestive enzymes. So again, hip bones connected to the thigh bones, connected to the knee bones, connected to the ankle bone. So you cannot separate what is going on in the gut from what is going on in the brain and vice versa. And again, for a deeper dive, it's on my bookshelf over here somewhere, but I really don't have my books um, arranged alphabetically, I really should. But my friend Emron Mayer, his book, uh, The Mind-Gut Connection, came out several years ago. Great read, if you wanna go deep, on this, um, that would be a great place to start, okay? So we've talked about the enteric nervous system, the second brain in the gut. We have talked about the gut-brain connection, the influence on the gut, mood, behavior, cognition, influence, brain influencing the gut on 
motility, digestive enzymes, secretion, absorption, assimilation of nutrients. And there are other things too, but these are the big ones I want you to know about. Now, let's talk about two factors that can dramatically influence what is going on in your gut. The first one I wanna talk about is antibiotics. And for those of you who may not know, the whole reason I sort of shifted, if you will, from being a conventional gastroenterologist who did a lot of procedures, wrote a lot of prescriptions, um, to a groovy integrative gastroenterologist who's very concerned and very much a believer in the power of food as medicine and how to really find the root cause for gut disorders and try and heal the gut rather than just apply a prescription band-aid. My whole motivation for that was my experience with my daughter when she was born 17 and a half years ago, uh, C-section, minimal breastfeeding, tons of antibiotics at the C-section, and at birth for, you know, long story. If you wanna, if you wanna hear the full thing, um, read my first book, Gut Bliss. I talk about it in all the books, but I really tell the whole story in my first book, Gut Bliss, about how that experience with her extensive antibiotics at birth and throughout the first few years of her life, more than 20 courses of antibiotics before she was two, how that dramatically affected her health and really opened my eyes to the importance of the microbiome and what can happen when it is altered profoundly as it was with her, okay? So um, let us now talk about antibiotics. My first real introduction to the idea that antibiotics are incredibly damaging to the gut microbiome was through Marty Blazer's book, Missing Microbes, which came out a few years before my first book, Gut Bliss. Marty Blazer is an infectious disease doctor. He was head of infectious diseases at NYU at the time. I don't know if he still is, but Missing Microbes is a great read. And I remember reading a statistic in that book that literally stopped me in my tracks. And remember, this is an infectious disease doctor. These doctors prescribe antibiotics, okay? It's not a gastroenterologist. So as I like to remind people, when the infectious disease doctor is raising the alarm, ringing that alarm bell, ding, 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 danger, we all need to pay attention because they prescribe antibiotics for a living. So, so they, you know, I think have a higher threshold for saying, oh, maybe the antibiotic is such a good idea. I have a low threshold because I'm dealing with the end result of too many antibiotics in people's gut. So I'm like, yeah, it's never a good time for an antibiotic. If death is imminent, maybe. Again, this is not medical advice, okay? And I'm being a bit facetious here, but um, they have a different threshold. And so Marty Blazer, in his terrific book, Missing Microbes, the, the one statistic I read that stopped me in my tracks was the fact that a course of broad spectrum antibiotics, and by a course, we're typically talking about five to 10 days, let's say a week. What do I mean by broad spectrum antibiotics? Antibiotics that are designed to kill a wide array of pathogens, which is most of the antibiotics we use. It's really uncommon that we can use a narrow spectrum antibiotic like penicillin, for example, because so many bacteria are resistant to antibiotics because they're overused. And so we have to use these broad spectrum, powerful ones that kill a lot of bacteria. And so that's great. It is likely gonna get your pathogen, but it's not so great because it's almost certainly gonna knock out a lot of your healthy bacteria. And Marty Blazer talked about the statistic that a course, five to, eight to 10 days a week, of a broad spectrum antibiotic that you would use to treat, for example, a sinus infection, a urinary tract infection, a respiratory tract infection, can remove up to a third of your gut microbes, one third. And for those of you who are thinking, okay, I'll just go to the pharmacy and get me some probiotics, that is magical thinking. As I like to say, that is like taking a bathtub, draining it, and then putting in one cup of water and saying, okay, I refill the bathtub. So there is no probiotic out there which can completely mitigate the effects of an antibiotic, okay? Antibiotics are designed to kill bacteria. Anti against biota, bacteria. That is what they do. And there's no antibiotic that is only killing the pathogen. They are all going to have significant amounts of damage against other gut microbes and how much damage will depend on how long you take them for, how powerful they are, and sort of what the general health of your microbiome is. So if you are somebody who've, who's been on a lot of antibiotics, you know, since childhood, like my daughter, 
if you are somebody who does not eat a great diet, if you're somebody who's also been on acid blockers, if you, you know, if you have a lot of hits to your gut terrain, a lot of things that can be causing uh, disruption to your gut terrain, your gut soil, the microbiome, the gut lining, etc., you're going to be more susceptible. If you're somebody who, you know, had a pretty healthy childhood, got exposed to the outdoors, ate a reasonable diet, um, didn't take a lot of medication, and you take a course of antibiotics in adulthood, you're probably gonna be fine, right? So it is a sum total, it's a cumulative influence of these factors that can really mess up your gut terrain. But nonetheless, that was, for me, a startling statistic. It's like, wow, a third of the gut bacteria. But I have to tell you, I wasn't surprised because I was seeing the fallout in my patients who were coming in, people who were, you know, been on doxycycline for a year for Lyme disease or been on tetracycline for acne or whatever it was, or multiple rounds of antibiotics for sinus infections or prophylactic suppressive antibiotics for urinary tract infections. I know OBGYNs who tell women, you know, take macrobit or some other antibiotic every time you have sex to prevent a urinary tract infection. Very effective for that, but unfortunately very destructive for the gut. So these are all the patients I'm seeing. I have some great questions coming in. This is a great one about wisdom teeth removed. Um, so I'm gonna to get to the questions in just a minute. I'm gonna talk for a few more minutes and then I'll scroll through and get to all your questions. So. So antibiotics, again, we need more judicious use. We need to be good stewards. And Tina, I'll come back to your question, but um, my recommendation for dental stuff that's prophylactic is to say to the dentist, um, thank you very much, I'm gonna get this prescription filled, but I would prefer to wait and see if there's an actual infection. Is that okay? What are the signs of an actual infection? What should I look out for? Would it be pain? Because there's pain anyway after wisdom tooth instruct removal. Would there be swelling? Would there be a fever, etc.? What are the signs that would indicate to me and my son that we need to start the antibiotic versus having it there at the ready, get it filled. It's literally, you know, it's right there in the medicine cabinet. And, you know, could we get away without taking it? I know when I had to have dental work recently, I've gone on and on about that. Um, I was, you know, very adamant about preferring not to take an antibiotic and the oral surgeon who was wonderful, Dr. Ziad Ali, he gave me a little rinse to use instead. And he said, use this and, you know, good oral hygiene and you'll be fine. I was able to avoid them, but everybody's different. And here's the thing. I don't like people telling me how to practice medicine. I mean, I don't mind them suggesting or asking questions, but you know, my particular way of doing things has been developed over 30 years of being a doctor. And I want to give other physicians the same respect for how they practice, what their experiences are. But fine to ask pointed questions, fine to you know really um, prevent, provide them with the evidence for why you want to do it that way. But you you know you have to give a little leeway for people based on their experience. So your um, oral surgeon who did your son's extraction may have said, "Gosh, you know my." infection rate is really high once you do the antibiotics, in which case that's a problem in of itself. But, you know, have that discussion. Don't go in there saying, ah, absolutely not. I'm not taking antibiotics. What else you got? You know, just go in there having a dialogue and you know what? Be ready to do some education because healthcare professionals are not as well informed as a lot of you out there. So um, keep in mind that the oral surgeon, whoever it is, may not be aware of the latest data that this is not a prophylactic recommendation is not required anymore, okay? So antibiotics, problematic for everybody, number one. Especially problematic for younger people, why? Because in those first three years of life and up to about 18, the microbiome is still forming, it's still developing, it's still developing diversity, robustness, etc. So it's very tender in those first 18 years. There's a little more stability in middle life. And then as we get older, we also want to encourage more diversity in the microbiome if we want to be less frail and age better. So antibiotics, number one. So, okay, we covered enteric nervous system. We covered gut brain connection. We covered antibiotics in the microbiome, ultra processed foods. You know, I am on a tear these days over ultra processed foods. And that's because we're eating too many of them. I mean, the data for the US, Canada, other sort of more developed countries is it's north of 50% of the diet. In the US, depending on what study you read, it's 52 to 55% of the diet, but 
In some populations, it's 80 to 90%, and in some it's lower. And here's the thing, I understand that in the US, certain populations, and there's very much, there's a strong socioeconomic correlation here. Some people live in food deserts. There's no fresh food available. Ultra processed foods is all they have within you know a five or 10 mile radius of where they live. I understand convenience that there are people who are working two and three jobs and they don't have time to shop and cook and all they have time to do is grab something to feed themselves and their children based on economics again, right? So, you know, believe me, I am not in some bubble who thinks that everybody's at the farmer's market every weekend and, and only in Whole Foods in the farmer's market and we have tons of time to shop and cook and I get it, okay? And I certainly believe that our government needs to do a better job of providing access to fresh whole food and not just improving access to health care. I mean, improving access to health care so you can see a doctor and get medication when you already have diabetes and hypertension and you are struggling with obesity is not helpful. So we need better access. I'm glad to know that the Fresh Farms Farmers Market in DuPont Circle, I'm very proud to know that they accept food stamps and other forms of social assistance for people. But again, it's still DuPont Circle, not, you know, everybody lives within an easy way to get there, right? Not everybody has time on a Sunday to go to the farmer's market. So this is a public health issue that we need to address as a society. We need to make sure that everybody has access to green spaces, has time for leisure, and has access to low cost whole foods. Because why? Because it's the right thing to do and because it is way more expensive to pay for it on the other end. So not only do those foods, and that statistic in the US that the average American diet is 52 to 55% ultra processed foods, I'm gonna do another office hours next week on the NOVA classification of ultra processed foods, the four classifications, one through four, four being the worst, um, so that you're very clear on what constitutes an ultra processed food. So we'll do that next week. but. To get back to this, what's the problem? The problem is that high consumption of those foods is associated with increased risk of chronic diseases. What kind of diseases am I talking about? The ones I just mentioned, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, heart disease, autoimmune diseases, all the bad stuff, okay? And they're also associated with an increased risk of dying. A study from last month showed that uh, it was this is a Brazilian study where they actually, the ultra processed food consumption is a lower percentage of the diet than in the US. And they showed that was associated with a 10.5 increased risk of premature death. What's the problem with ultra processed foods? Well, some of them don't actually even contain food. The class four ones contain bioengineered food ingredients, which means food derived from food, uh, ingredients derived from food, but not actual food. And the example I used, I think, in last week's rant, or some recent reel I did, was that you can make, Goodyear makes car tires from corn, but car tires are not food. So the fact that something is derived from food doesn't make it food. So the problem is some of these foods don't actually, some of these edible food-like substances, as I like to call them, don't actually contain real food. In addition, it's one thing to add salt or something to prolong the shelf life, but some of them have additives, non-nutritive additives that are actually damaging to the gut lining. They either destroy microbes or they interfere with communication between microbes um, or they lead to overgrowth of more pathogenic microbes. So they do all kinds of things. And we know this for sure. This is not speculation, okay? This is fact. So we know that antibiotics disruptive to the microbiome, kill off a lot of your healthy gut bacteria. We know ultra processed foods, disruptive to the gut microbiome, kill off healthy gut bacteria, cause overgrowth of not helpful bacteria, interfere with communication between the bacteria, uh, problem to the gut lining, potentially increase intestinal permeability. So now I hope you're starting to see the connection, right? Because we talked about what's going on in the gut and the gut terrain, it's not just a microbiome, it's also the gut lining, it's a gut immune connection, it's all of it, right? So now you know how the antibiotics disrupt the gut, how the ultra processed foods disrupt the gut, and how an unhealthy gut is going to affect the brain. So now let's talk about two really, really important studies. The first is the antibiotic study. And there, there are tons of studies out there, but you know, I wanna, I wanna give you highlights for some of the really 
significant ones because there are many that show the same thing, but these are studies that I think were particularly well done that are particularly instructive. So the first one was from March of 2022, and this was part of the Nurses Health Study. And in this study, they looked at 14,500 nurses, and these were all female nurses. Of course, we have male nurses too, but this was a study looking at women. And so again, 14,500. The important thing about this study and the other study I'm gonna tell you about is it was longitudinal. It was across time. It wasn't looking at just one period in time. This study spanned seven years. They did neurocognitive assessment on the participants at the beginning and they followed them. And about seven years later, they assessed them again. And what did they find? They found that, and they were looking at women in midlife. So somewhere around the 50s, that goes up every year for me, midlife. Midlife will soon be in the 70s, but um, this is women in the 50s. And what they found was that two months or more of cumulative antibiotics, not two months in a row, over the seven year period, these female nurses who had taken more than two months worth of antibiotics, two months or more actually, had a significant decline in cognition. They had a decline in psychomotor skills. They had a decline in learning uh, and memory. How much of a decline? Well, they give, you know, if you look at the study and the study was published in PLS, PLOS 1, if you, and if you just put in nurses, um, antibiotics in nurses, decreased cognition, the study will pop right up. They have different scores for all the different areas, right, of the neurocognitive assessment. But let me give you the overall picture. The overall picture was that the decline in global cognition as a result of the antibiotic use was equivalent to aging the brain three to four years. Let me say it again. In the study of 14,500 participants looking over seven years at the effects of two months or more of antibiotics, compared to people who were not on the antibiotics and they controlled for level of education, chronic disease, etc. So they're really looking apples to apples, antibiotic uses versus not, equivalent to aging your brain three to four years. Very significant. Significant decline in global cognition. So it wasn't just one thing like a mood disorder. It was psychomotor skills. It was learning. It was working memory, etc. Number one. The interesting thing about this study is, again, we think about the microbiome as being more stable in those middle years, but this is showing like it is not as stable as we think. It is very susceptible. That's a big hit. And that's not that much antibiotics, two months over seven years. I mean, think about it. If you're taking a week of antibiotics a year, that's, you know, going to be essentially close to two months, right? That's going to be seven weeks. So if one course is 10 days, you know, you're there. Okay, let's talk about the second study because we're at 1230. I want to make sure I get time for all your fantastic questions. The second study, hot off the press, came out December 5th. This was published in the Journal of Neurology. And this study looked at, it's a study from Brazil, from Sao Paulo. They have a big center there. Some of the researchers there were very pivotal in coming up with the NOVA classification. So Brazil is way ahead of the curve in studying consumption of ultra-processed foods. Australia has had some great studies too. I have to say that I think in the US, these studies are not as common because the lobbying from the Food Manufacturer Association. I mean, we have had some exposés recently that the very nonprofit organizations that are supposed to be guiding us in terms of creating guidelines are actually taking tons of money from the soft drink manufacturers, the processed food, et cetera. So there, I think there's a lot of conflict, unfortunately, here with the lobbying, et cetera, and the amounts of money being spent and not as much research. I, I feel like, you know, the public health messaging here is a little bit damped down by some of these companies. So anyway, enough of that conspiracy theory. Uh, let's talk about the study. So what did they find in this study? This is a study that looked at over 10,000 people 
from Brazil again, and it also looked longitudinally. It looked at over eight years, which is really, really significant. There was an Australian study that came out a year or two ago, also showing a link between ultra processed food and cognitive decline, but that was sort of one point in time. I think it was two 24 hour periods. So this is one of the first studies to look over eight years. And again, like the nurses study with the antibiotics, they did neurocognitive assessment early and they did it throughout and, and at that eight year endpoint. And what did they find? They found that if more than 25% of your diet was ultra processed food, sorry, they found that if more than 20% of your diet was ultra processed food, there was as much as a 25% decline in global cognition, okay? So more than 20%. When I did something, I believe it was last week, it's all a blur on ultra processed foods and that NOVA classification, I said, make sure these foods are less than 10% of your diet. And, with, and that was before the study came out. So now that we have these study results, 20%, that's not that much, a 25% decline. And they also found it wasn't just cognition, it was also executive function, which, you know, that gets more challenging each day, right? Being able to really sort of keep it together with what you have to get done and being efficient and all of that. So there you have it enteric nervous system, gut brain connection, antibiotics and ultra processed foods damage the gut and particularly the gut microbiome and therefore lead to significant decreases in cognition. So what, just let me wrap up for one minute and I'll get to all your questions. What I want to remind you, you know, it's beyond just we are what we eat. We are how we live. These things, you know, we've been blaming stuff on genes for a long time. In the 30 years since we have able to completely map the human genome, guess how many genetic diseases we have cured? Zero, because the genes are just a suggestion. The genes are not our destiny. The epigenetic factors of which diet is a primary one are super important. Now, I could tell you studies about sleep and how lack of sleep can affect cognition and increase your risk of dementia, about stress, about, you know, lack of exposure to the outdoors, etc. There are a lot of things, okay? But these are two modifiable. We can have those difficult discussions with our healthcare providers about the antibiotics and say the most important question to ask, is this antibiotic absolutely necessary and then go down from there if you want the whole list buy the new book oh where is it i usually have it on the shelf here oh let me get it okay buy the new book the antiviral gut because in the plan i go through all those questions about you know what to ask your doctor and also what you could do instead for a lot of these medications so you must 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 have those conversations I don't care how terrible your sinus infection is. And if you feel terrible, I still want you to ask because what a lot of the studies show is that for things like sinus infections, that many of those will be self-limited and the antibiotics are just shortening the course by a couple days. So, okay, you're shortening the course of feeling miserable by a couple days, but you may be swapping a significant decrease in global cognition. Again, this is not medical advice. I'm not telling you to suck it up and don't take an antibiotic, but I am telling you to have those important conversations. And trust me, your person who's doing the prescribing, the ENT doc, they don't know this information. They are not reading this, okay? They may, but it's pretty unusual. I mean, I have a lot of doctor friends and they're all wonderful. When I talk to them about this stuff, they're like, hmm, really? And I'm like, again, this stuff isn't somebody's blog. These are, these are, you know, scientific studies that are published in big journals, in peer-reviewed journals, but people, you know, tend to stay in their zone. So the ear, nose, and throat doctor, they're reading, you know, their ear, nose, and throat articles. They're not reading general stuff about the gut microbiome. So don't assume that your doctor knows. Don't, you know, make them feel bad that they don't know, like, Ugh, what kind of doctor are you? You're not up on this. Um, engage them, educate them, have a dialogue with them, involve them so that you are partners in your healthcare and you are advocating for yourself and you are kind of bringing them along if they need, if they need to be brought along there, okay? Because remember, they are well-intentioned. Most physicians, they want you to feel better and that's what they know. In their mind, they're gonna give you an antibiotic, you're gonna feel better. And that is likely true, but there is obviously a huge cost on the back end. 
And they may not know that you've been taking two or three courses of antibiotics a year for 10 years, right? So they may not be aware of what your personal risk is. They're just thinking, you have a sinus infection. I have an antibiotic for you. So, you know, give them a little grace, but make sure and have that conversation, all right? Um, I think I've spoken long enough. Okay, let's get to some questions. All right, so I'm gonna scroll to the top. Um, okay. So first of all, again, thank you all for joining me. I realize this is lunchtime, people are busy. It may be early on the West Coast. Okay, Park City Julie, I know many artificial sweeteners have an impact on the gut microbiome, but I'm curious if monk fruit has an impact too. Well, you are absolutely right, Julie. Many do, particularly, you know, aspartame, saccharin, stevia, we now know, interferes with communication between gut microbes. I have to tell you, I don't know the data on monk fruit. But I will look that up. Um, but I have been sort of exhaustively going through this literature, not just for the books, but for my own edification. And I have not come across anything specific about monk fruit. It's really, Julie, the non-nutritive sweeteners. So it's the ones that are zero calories or low calorie or one calorie, which monk fruit is not. Okay. Thank you for asking. All right. What else we got? I saw a bunch lower down. Um, I will also ask too, so in addition to buying the book, um, do think about subscribing to the Gutless blog and uh, follow me on Instagram. Um, all right, let's keep going. Oh, you're very welcome. Lots of thank you. So thank you for the thank yous. Um, okay, Sharon wants to know how to increase motility. Sharon, it's a great question, but it depends on what is causing the dysmotility. It's sort of like saying, well, how do you increase Energy level, if you're tired, well, it depends. If you have an underactive thyroid, you wanna get your thyroid working properly. If you're just deconditioned from not exercising, you wanna start exercising. If you're taking a medication that's making you tired, you gotta address that. So if you're sleep deprived, you gotta get better sleep. So it's the same thing for gut motility. There are a lot of things that affect gut motility. Medications, you know, the medicine cabinet, as I sometimes call it, the menace cabinet, I am, Big believer, it's the first place I go with my patients is I tell them, bring everything you're taking, supplements, over-the-counter, prescription, I wanna see it all. Lay it out on my desk and I typically then start throwing them into the rubbish bin. Um, at least, you know, the ones that are not necessary. And the prescription ones, I'm like, okay, you're gonna ask your internist to prescribe this about such and such. You can go ask your cardiologist about such and such. But um, what I find is, and you know, I'm not unusual in this, the GI tract, you know, you're ingesting these medications. They are having an effect on the GI tract and often also on the liver. So a big thing is, are you taking a medication that's slowing down gut motility or constipating you? So what are some of those things? It could be calcium channel blockers. It could be supplements, particularly those with iron, beta blockers, antidepressants, um, anti-anxiety, a lot of drugs affect gut motility and most of them tend to slow it down. Some drugs speed it up and they will increase gut motility, but that's unusual, okay? So you gotta look at the medicine cabinet. You gotta think about your habits. You know, if you're not moving, neither are your bowels. So if you are spending a lot of time sitting, even if you're standing at a standing desk, you're still not moving. So you have to think about your activity level. You have to think about your hydration. Minimum, take a sip, minimum, half your body weight in ounces of water. So that means if you weigh 150 pounds, 75 ounces of water. If you weigh 200 pounds, 100 ounces of water. As a minimum starting point, and that's plain water, not coffee, tea, anything else. You have to think about what you're eating. We know that food has a profound effect on gut motility. Are you eating a lot of starchy, processed carbohydrates that are slowing you down? Are you getting enough high fiber foods? At legumes, etc., beans and greens. So lots of different things that affect motility. We know dysbiosis, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, other forms of dysbiosis can affect the microbiome and can affect gut motility. So for example, if we see SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, that is very methane predominant where there's the kinds of bacteria that are overgrowing or producing a lot of a gas called methane that tends to be associated with low motility. We know there are disorders that can affect gut motility like gastroparesis, which typically it sort of means paralysis of the stomach. Your, your stomach isn't really paralyzed, but the nerves that affect contractility of the stomach are affected and we can see gastroparesis with diabetes as a result of viral illnesses, as a result of medications, as a part of 
autoimmune diseases. So there are many, many causes. And so increasing motility, the first thing is we have to identify why your motility is low. And some general things, obviously hydration, fiber, movement, ginger can be helpful, but I couldn't really give you any specific recommendations from an educational point of view without knowing what the cause of your delayed motility is. Okay, all right, so what else do we have? Um, Tina, we talked about your son and his wisdom teeth. Um, and again, you know, if it's a couple of days of antibiotics, probably not a big deal. But if your son has been on lots of antibiotics over his life, if he eats poorly, you know, lots of ultra processed foods, not a lot of fruits and vegetables, if he has been on other medications that affect his microbiome, then it could be more significant. Even if he is, you know, never been on antibiotics, I still want you to ask the oral surgeon or the dentist. Is this absolutely necessary? Some of the stuff we talked about, okay? I hope he heals up fast. Um, how harmful are antivirals? That's such a good question. And that's a little bit outside the sphere of this, but um, I tell you what, sign up for my free antiviral gut masterclass. It's gonna be February 7th. You can sign up through um, the link in bio. You can sign up through the robinchuckhand.com site or through gutless.com. It says you need proof of purchase for the book, but I want everybody who wants to do it to be able to attend. It's completely free. So just take a picture of the book. Like if you haven't bought it, I mean, it'd be great if you buy it. If you haven't bought it, just take a picture of it and upload it. We're not checking, just upload something. So we will talk about that during the Antiviral Gut Masterclass. Thank you for asking. Oh, I will definitely keep these talks coming. You keep coming and bring a friend to them. Okay. Um, Tina, what can I do to fix his gut now that he took them? Okay, so he already took them for the wisdom teeth. Um, if you get the book, in there I have a list of questions to ask before antibiotics and a list of things you can do after you've taken antibiotics, including some advice on probiotics. So check that out in the book and you'll have step-by-step -step instructions for what to do. Okay. Um, Yes, it was an excellent question that Tina asked. All right, so from Intended Well, not born C-section, but mom had to stop breastfeeding when I was three months to have her gallbladder out, ironic, and five rounds of antibiotics before I was one year old. How much of the microbiome can be recovered? A lot. We know from a study that was done in 2014 and published in the journal Nature that shifting the diet from a primarily high fat, high protein to a primarily high fiber plant-based diet can cause changes in the gut microbiome within as quickly as 30 hours of food hitting the gut, okay? We know from the American Gut Project study in 2018 that eating 30 or more different plant foods per week, so not just vegetables, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, whole grains, beans, uh, herbs, spices, nuts, seeds, if I hadn't said it, we know that 30 or more different plant foods per week is associated with a much healthier, more diverse microbiome. We know that exposure to soil microbes by getting out in nature, all of these things can dramatically improve the microbiome. So all is not lost. Okay. Um, you're so welcome, Sarah Maria Wilson. Thank you for the thank you. Okay, Leanne says, gray, dull, lower eardrum. Dot put me on a steroid, no spray to try for two weeks. And if not cleared up, possible hearing test, ENT appointment. Tinnitus, which is ringing in the ears. Any alternative to steroid, no spray. Okay, Leanne. I am not an ENT and I did not look at your eardrum. So, you know, it's really difficult for me as a gastroenterologist to tell you what to do for the eardrum. But I'll tell you this, you don't want to mess around with your hearing. So I agree, the hearing test with the audiologist is a good idea particularly if not only is it looking funny, but you're having ringing. And I know that sometimes they will use antihistamine sprays as an alternative to the steroid, but you, you gotta work it out with the ENT, okay? You gotta ask them, all right. And certainly a spray is going to be better than an antibiotic spray, and it's gonna be a steroid spray, less disruptive, and it's also going to be better than taking steroids orally, systemically, or antibiotics, but um, you gotta ask them these questions. I'm glad you're thinking about them. Okay, the lifestyle building, I will definitely keep it coming. You're so welcome. Um, Park City Julie, Park City Julie, spot on. I'm so glad you mentioned that. They use a lot of antibiotics in the animal industry. In fact, 80% of the antibiotics used in America 
are used in the animal industry. They're used for two particular reasons. They're used for animal fattening. Animals that are fed antibiotics on a regular basis grow up to 15% faster, which means more money. And just as they're fattening the animals, they are likely fattening us when we take them or when we eat the animals. So 80%, they're used to fatten the animals and they're used prophylactically, particularly things like the dairy industry. If you have ever seen in real life or a video of these poor dairy cows on the milk line, you know that they are squeezed into these little, you know, stalls and their teats are just hooked up to these things that are going all the time. And they're given all kinds of hormones, which they are allowed to give and still call the milk organic as long as the hormones occur in nature. So think about that when you're buying your organic dairy, that if the hormones exist in nature, they can give it to them. And they're giving them hormones to increase their milk production because the more milk these cows produce, the more money people make. And that is what it is about. They are not, these food manufacturers could not give two hoots about your health. They are in, do, in these businesses for profit. And there's a lot of funny marketing and labeling, etc. So there are antibiotics used for animal fattening. There are antibiotics used to prevent infection because again, they're, they're you know, giving the animals hormones to increase milk production. There's a lot of milking all the time and the machinery on the teats, they get infected. And you know, you see some of these videos, there's like pus and stuff getting into the milk. It's, oh, okay, they're supposed to pull the animals out of the milk line when they're on antibiotics, but of course nobody's checking and nobody's doing it. And there was a New York Times expose several years ago that showed that a high percentage of um, the milk contained antibiotics. So we are getting those antibiotics. And so Park City Julie wants to know, thank you, Julie, for raising that really important point. Do I think consuming animal products exposed to antibiotics has an impact? 100% it has an impact, yes. Um, yes, we get to support each other in community. I love it. Um, I wish I could be with you all in person. We'll have to figure that out. You have to all come to my office one day. Um, all right. What more questions do we have? Um, yeah, sleep shield blog, not convenient to know the truth. You're so right about that. And I, you know, I, I was stunned the other day. I had posted a study that I thought was a really important study about maternal diet and severity of RSV. And um, while the majority of people said, thank you for that information, it was showing that a maternal diet during pregnancy, high in sugary starchy food, especially things like sugar sweetened beverages, leads to worse outcomes for RSV in the babies. But a couple of people were like, ah, oh, stop shaming mothers. And I'm like, what? You need to know this information. And I made the point that if we as physicians hadn't realized that cigarette smoking caused lung cancer and made that information public, you know, a lot of people wouldn't be alive today. Like we have to make this information public. We are not shaming people. We are, you know, I eat ultra processed foods. I just try not to eat a lot of them. And so we have to know, and we have to individually calculate our risk and make these decisions. And we have to go into it eyes wide open, right? That none of this stuff is free. You have to know what the consequences are if you are eating a lot of these foods. That's my job as a physician is to educate everybody. So not to get all adamant, but yes, you know, do not be afraid of the truth. As I have said before, knowledge is power. It doesn't mean we're gonna act on every single thing. I know that I should get to bed earlier and I fail most nights. I start to make my bedward descent. And I'm like, great, it's 10, 15, but then when I finally am actually falling asleep I'm like oh now it's 11 45 how did that happen so there are things we know we don't necessarily you know succeed every single time right but we need to move towards those goals and if we don't know where the goal post is we can't move towards it all right um Karen, uh, Befit for Life, Karen Davidson wants to know how old were they in this study? I don't know what study you're talking about, Karen, but in the nurse's health study, um, midlife, which they defined as in their 50s. Okay. Um, what else do we have? I'm so glad you like my office hours. Where can we get access to these studies to share with fellow practitioners? Okay. The antibiotic study was published in March 2022 because this is Medical Bits who joined. Um, and this was published in PLOS1, March 2022. And the title is Association of Midlife Antibiotic Use with Subsequent Cognitive Function in Women. 
This replay will be up so you can find this here too at about minute 51. But again, PLOS1, Association of Midlife Antibiotic Use with Subsequent Cognitive Function in Women, March 2022. Second study was published in JAMA Neurology, December 2022, I think it was December 5th, and that was um, the ultra-processed foods and cognitive decline, okay? So those are the two studies, and I'm so glad you wanna share them with fellow practitioners. Um, all right, oh, Heather says, my book is amazing. Thank you, Heather. Heather, do me a huge favor. If you like the book, drop me a review in Amazon, a star rating. I mean, I tend to not pay attention to these things, but apparently these things really matter. And my wonderful publishing team at Avery are like, please, if somebody, you know, I'm not sort of soliciting it, but if somebody says they like the book, if you would literally one line, one word, it matters because when people find the book, they do look at the reviews. So please do that for me and I would love that. Okay. Um, Sharon, I'm so sorry, you have Lyme. Uh, Medical Bits wants to know, seeing lots of H. pylori infections, what do we think of triple and quadruple therapy? Uh, yes, some people get reinfections sometimes. Um, isn't the antibiotic excessive hair? I couldn't agree with you more. Here's the thing with H. pylori. We have to take a more nuanced approach to it. This idea that the only good H. pylori is a dead H. pylori is totally wrong. And for those of you who may not know what Medical Bits is referring to, H. pylori is Helicobacter pylori, a bacteria in the stomach, Australian gastroenterologist made the connection between these rod-shaped bacteria in the stomach and stomach irritation and in some people, stomach cancer, won uh, the Nobel Prize for that. But we've had to dial back the H. pylori because it turns out that the acquisition rate of H. pylori is about 10% per decade, okay? So I've got 50%, slightly over 50% chance of having H. pylori. My 17-year-old has about a 10 to 20% chance of having H. pylori. and it's not necessarily bad. And in fact, eradicating it can lead to problems. And we don't know if that's because H. pylori could be doing something good in people or it's because of excessive antibiotics, the triple and quadruple regimens that are used to eradicate it. We do know in certain groups, H. pylori is associated with active inflammation in the stomach, gastritis, and that that gastritis can be a risk factor for stomach cancer. But that is not true of everybody with H. pylori. So my tendency as a gastroenterologist is I will check for it if there is active inflammation in the stomach. But if the stomach looks fine, I'm typically not checking for it. But I, I like you, I am just as concerned about the therapy for eradicating it. And what I see a lot is somebody goes to the gastroenterologist and they say, oh, I'm really bloated. I'm you know, having a lot of burping, I'm uncomfortable, what we would describe as sort of functional dyspepsia. And so the gastroenterologist, of course, does an endoscopy, because that's what we do, and does a biopsy for H. pylori, even though the stomach looks totally normal, and then says, aha, you have H. pylori, this is a problem. And they treat them with three or four antibiotics for two weeks. And during this time, they typically would have a lot of distress from the antibiotics. And then the H. pylori is all gone, and guess what? symptoms exactly the same, sometimes worse, because there we don't have good evidence that symptoms like that, non-functional dyspepsia, are associated with H. pylori. Often that could be, you know, the patient's constipated, they have some food intolerances, they're, you know, have a motility disorder. So we're often drawing a straight line from H. pylori to these symptoms, and that's not correct. And then we're also exposing people to, you know, two weeks of four, three or four different antibiotics. So I'm glad you pointed that out. Um, okay, Kristen says, I'm trying so hard to get as many veggies as possible into my teens and preteens, but when they're not home, they eat a lot of junk. Does this negate the positive effects of the veggies? Kristen, I am so glad you asked that because in that study I was just telling you about from Brazil, the ultra processed food study, they found that high quality diet, fruits and veggies, help to negate the effects of the ultra processed foods. It's very difficult with the teenagers. I mean, my daughter, I'm like a stock record. When she was younger, she, you know, we had her eating dal lentil patties and split pea soup and you know, green smoothies and I was just stuffing that stuff into her. And granted, she was antibiotic injured. She had antibiotics at birth, she was a C-section baby, minimal breastfeeding, and she had over 20 courses of antibiotics before she was two. So she was an extreme, and she was sick all the time. Sick with colds, coughs, air infections, strep. 
She had a rotavirus infection that landed her up in the hospital at age two with kidney failure, liver failure. So she was extreme, extreme of being a sickly child. Um, your teens and preteens, I hope that is not their history. So they are going to eat crap with their, I mean, I tell my daughter all the time, I'm like CVS does not sell actual food. CVS sells edible food like substances. You cannot feed yourself from CVS or the gas station, but they, they are going to do that, okay? So you are exactly on the right track with trying to get the veggies and the fruit into them. And if they are eating some good nutritious food with you at home, they're gonna be fine. They're gonna be fine, right? And I don't think they're gonna eat like this the rest of their life. I think this is a phase that the teens go through and they're independent and they're out with friends and this is what they're doing. So if you can, you know, stick a carrot in their back pocket as they're going out the door, get them to chew on that, make delicious, yummy veggies at home, make smoothies, uh, put a lot of fruit in them, that's okay. Maybe you get to sneak some spinach in there. So if you're giving them that stuff at home, um, they're gonna be okay. All right. And you know, they're gonna remember this. Like at some point later on, they're gonna be like, oh yeah, you know, when I eat this stuff, I feel better. It's kind of like my mom said. Okay, how does a person recover from unavoidable antibiotic use after surgery? What should the patient eat? Okay, not to stuck, sound like a stuck record, it's all in here, the antiviral gut. Um, my second book also, The Microbiome Solution, has very similar information, but that book was seven years ago. So this book is much more up to date in terms of what you can eat to create a healthy gut and to mitigate specifically the effects of antibiotics. It's a whole section in there, okay. Um, methane, SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and Lyme, and gastroparesis. Oh my goodness, Sharon, that's such a lot. I'm so sorry that you're struggling with all of that. Okay. Um, Karen says, I'm 57, fit, healthy, hypothyroid, sucrose intolerant. I bloat every single day. Should I do the GI map? I would not. I have never found the GI map test to be helpful. It tells me nothing. I think you have to work with a practitioner um, whether that's an integrative gastroenterologist or a really good registered dietitian and think about maybe an elimination diet. Also see your internist, make sure there's some, nothing else going on. Make sure there's not endometriosis, fibroids, you know, an ovarian issue. Get really checked out. Get your colonoscopy, get an abdominal pelvic, start with maybe a transvaginal ultrasound, abdominal pelvic CAT scan, like investigate all of those things while you are also investigating whether there is a food piece, okay? And again, just education, not medical advice to you here, but good luck to you. Don't find the GI map test helpful at all. Okay, we are going to stop here because it is almost one o'clock and um, really enjoyed spending this time with you. As I said, next week, we're going to do the NOVA classification for ultra processed foods and talk about how all of these different constituents affect your gut. Okay, it was great hanging with you today.